So welcome to the, the panel discussion, the ST based practice toward a more diverse and inclusive mathematical community. And uh, just to start, I would uh, like to invite uh, Robert Bryant, uh, the chair of COD to make an opening remark. So please. Thank you, Motoko. Uh, I'm going to share the, uh, the uh, website for the, the webpage for the uh, Ad Hoc Committee on Diversity. Uh, I, I hope everyone can see this. The, uh, the Ad Hoc Committee on Diversity was appointed uh, in uh, the summer of 2020. Uh, and uh, you can read about it on the, uh, on the webpage. There's, uh, there's the web address that you can see for, but you can also find it by the uh, uh, simply Googling International Mathematical Union Committee on Diversity. And the, the point, the, the purpose of the, uh, the Ad Hoc Committee on Diversity was, uh, is uh, threefold. The, the idea is of course that, you know, mathematics is a, has the potential to be one of the most diverse activities in, uh, uh, in the scientific community. And, uh, and it's very important that an international organization such as the Inter International Mathematical Union work to promote diversity in, uh, in uh, access to mathematics in education and, uh, and uh, in meetings and support of young research mathematicians. Uh, and, the, uh, and our purpose was, to, uh, was basically to advise and inform the executive committee on what what can be done? First was uh, first was to assess how the IMU was has performed to date. Second, to offer our advice about how uh, they can improve their performance, and also offer advice on how the adhering organizations, such as, for example, in the United States, the American Mathematical Society, uh, can perform their their performance nationally, and uh, and. Our original intent was to have a uh, to make a presentation to the uh, to the IMU in uh, in St. Petersburg, but uh, but uh, of course now it's become virtualized, and we're now doing uh, two things. One is this joint session that uh, that we're all involved in here with the Committee for Women in Mathematics uh, to discuss issues of uh, uh, that are germane to both committees about what we can do. Uh, and, uh, and the other is we've contributed some questions to the exit questionnaire for the, for the people who register for the virtual session uh, to gain some data. Because one of the first things that, you know, that our panel decided we needed to do was assess how the IMU has performed to date. And there's actually very little data so far about, uh, about the diversity of attendance or or what barriers have existed to uh, full participation in the IMU. And so we spent some time developing a questionnaire and part of that will be incorporated into the questionnaire at the exit of uh, uh, the virtual ICM. Uh, I'll just say uh, just a little bit more that uh, the full information about the Committee on Diversity and, and how it operates is on this webpage. And there's a, also a list of the members as well as how you can contact the uh, we have been operating uh, independently from the Committee for Women in Mathematics uh, at first, but we're delighted to be working with them uh, in this presentation for the uh, for the virtual uh, 2022 ICM. We're looking forward to a, uh, a very productive discussion and uh, and uh, finding a way forward on all these issues that are concerned to both of us. Uh, at that let me turn it over to the uh, to the leaders of the panels and uh, and stop here. So much mute. Well, thank you very much uh, for your opening remark. And I would like to share my screen. The um, so you see it. Uh, so the uh, today's uh, this is today's agenda. Uh, Robert already gave an opening remark. And the afterwards, uh, the, we are going to have a panel discussion by Ed, Edri Lett. Uh, we have a panelist, uh, Carolina Alo, Alo, Alofo, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, from IPA Brazil. 
and Eddie uh, Tree Baskorov from uh, Institute of the Bandung, Indonesia, and the Nia Campbell Lane uh, from uh, United Kingdom, and the Anjam Hala from Pakistan, and Ekin Osman from Turkey, and Marie Francois Roy from France. So they are the today's panelists. Hello, my name is Carolina Araujo. I am a mathematician working in Brazil and vice chair of the IMU Committee for Women in Mathematics. Mathematics is usually referred to as a universal science. However, the experience of working as a mathematician is not the same for different social groups. Some groups have been historically marginalized. There have been advances, but still there are many barriers, some of them very visible, others more subtle. This is the case for women, non-binary people, black people, people with disabilities and other underrepresented groups. It is very important that we as a community speak and do something about this. So I'm very glad that we have this dedicated space in the virtual ICM 2022 to reflect on these issues. In this presentation, I will discuss the role of organizations for women in mathematics. All around the world, women mathematicians have come together to form collectives and societies. These organizations have different structures. Some of them are independent, others act as gender committees of national mathematical societies, but despite their difference, they also have much in common. They amplify women's voices and bring gender equity issues to the fore. They help to create spaces of deconstruction, fix stereotypes and develop policies that are more welcoming for those that have been left out. They can influence professional organizations and the mathematical community as a whole. I will illustrate some of these aspects by discussing specific actions of the Committee for Women in Mathematics of the IMU, the CWM. But before I do so, I would like to name a few continental organizations for women in mathematics. The oldest organization devoted to women in mathematics is the Association for Women in Mathematics, AWM, founded in the US in 1971. The European Women in Mathematics was, Mathematics was founded in 1986, while the African Women in Mathematics Association was founded in 2013. More recently, in 2020, the UMALCA, the Mathematical Union of Latin America and the Caribbean, created a Commission of Gender and Diversity. And finally, the Asian and Oceanian Women in Mathematics organization started to take shape in 2021 and we will, will be launched very soon in 2022. The CWM of the IMU was created in 2015. Its terms of reference include to promote international contacts between regional and organizations for women in mathematics, to publicize and suggest working practices that ensure equal opportunities for women mathematicians, and to promote actions to foster equal treatment of women in the mathematical community and lead to an increase of the representation of women in, the mathemat in mathematics at all levels. It is an honor for me to present the current Committee for Women in Mathematics with 10 members coming from different parts of the world. Let me discuss some of the activities carried out by the CWM. Since 2016, CWM has launched its annual calls. Through these calls, we have been supporting national and regional networks for women in mathematics with priority given to regional and continental organizations in developing country. Another important action is the World Meeting for Women in Mathematics, the WM Square. In 2018, CWM 
CWM organized the first WM Square in Rio de Janeiro as a satellite event of the ICM 2018. This was a great opportunity for a dialogue between women mathematicians from all over the world. The program of the World Meeting for Women in Mathematics also included a tribute to Maria Mirzakhani. To honor her memory, CWM created the Remember Maria Mirzakhani exhibition. The exhibition was inaugurated in the WM Square and remained open during the ICM 2018. After that, the exhibition was shown in dozens of places around the world. Also during the WM Square, the Women's Committee of the Iranian Mathematical Society proposed that May 12, which is the birthday of Maria Mirzahani, became a celebration day for women in mathematics. This proposal was approved by the participants, giving birth to the May 12 initiative which is now led by several national and continental organizations for women in mathematics worldwide. The second edition of the WM Square took place most virtually on July 1st and 2nd of 2022. I will not report on it because at the time when this presentation is being recorded, it has not taken place yet. Another important initiative of CWM is the scheme of CWM ambassadors. This scheme started in 2016 as a mailing list of special correspondents called CWM ambassadors. Initially, the job of CWM ambassadors consisted in disseminating information from CWM in their countries and helping us keep informed about activities and initiatives in their countries. Since then, it has evolved into an active international network for women in mathematics. There are now 175 CWM ambassadors from 105 different countries. Many of them also serve at gender committees of national societies. A network of CWM ambassadors has been facilitated, encouraging the exchange of experience and good practices between them. For this purpose, in 2021, with the help of many CWM ambassadors, we organized virtual meetings of CWM ambassadors by continent. As an example, let me describe some of these events. In October 2021, we had a two-day meeting of the Latin American CWM ambassadors, jointly organized with the Umalca Gender and Diversity Commission. The meeting included a workshop on how to deal with situations of gender violence. Later, together with CWM ambassadors from North America, we organized a Pan-American meeting of ambassadors. This meeting included a panel discussion about pathways to inclusion and diversity in mathematics, where we discussed not only gender, but also racial issues. In Europe, the meeting of CWM ambassadors was organized jointly with the European Women in Mathematics. In Africa, it was organized jointly with the African Women in Mathematics Association. In Asia, the meeting took place in combination with the preparations for the creation of the Asian and Oceanian Women in Mathematics platform. A global gathering of CWM ambassadors took, took place in February 11, 2022 marking the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Another important initiative undertaken by the CWM was the Gender Gap in Science project. This is a robust interdisciplinary project funded by the International Science Council that deserves a presentation for itself. You will learn more about it in Marie-Francoise Roy's talk. Through its activities, CWM has played an important role in promoting regional networks for women in mathematics all around the world. You can learn more about CWM activities in the CWM newsletters, which is issued every six months in May and November, and also in the CWM webpage, which is here. I thank you very much for your attention. Hello, everyone. It's an honor for me to speak on this very special occasion. 
our appreciation to the committee for this opportunity. I'm going to speak on the challenges in improving the quality and equity of mathematical research in Indonesia. Indonesia is a huge country. It consists of more than 17,000 islands. The total area more than 5 million square kilometers or about 1.2% of the world's land uh, area or it covers 76% of the European continent and Indonesia is the fourth populated country in the world. Diversities are Indonesia's main characteristic. However, from the very beginning, the founding fathers founded this nation state as a unitary country. Bineka Tunggal Ika is the motto of Indonesia, which means different, but still one. As a nation state, Indonesia consists of various ethnicities, languages, cultures, and religions. However, it's united in the uni unitary state of the Republic of Indonesia. This implies that the state was formed one for all. Every individual has the same rights and responsibilities as well as opportunities and equity before the law and the government, regardless of his or her background. Long before the formation of this nation, women had played a very big role together with men in liberating the nation from the colonialization. Female heroes from various regions contributed to Indonesia's independence. Some of them are Chutnyadin, for example, from Aceh, and Raden Ajeng Kartini from Central Java. Equal opportunities in various fields are given to everyone, regardless of their background, gender, ethnicities, origin, and religions. We have female president, Ibu Megawati, female ministers, yeah, female business leaders, and even great female scientists. The latest report shows that Indonesia is the fourth place as the country with the most female leadership. Gender equality is not an issue in Indonesia. Everyone has the same opportunity in any field, including mathematics. Indonesian Math Mathematics Society was built in 1976 with the initial aim of preparing mathematics teachers, strengthening their mathematics background, and at the same time, fostering and developing mathematics, mathematics education, and strengthening the role of mathematics in society. The main focus in the first 20 years is education, mainly at university level and at high school level. Research journal was firstly published in 1993 and the effort of internationalization began in 2006, I think, by joining uh, International Mathematics Union. And after that, various international level activities were carried out. The role of women in the mathematical community is also very dominant. We have been led by female presidents four times in mathematical community. The number of members is also now dominated by women. The percentage of women with doctoral degrees is also quite loud. And they are from various religions and ethnicities. In the last 20 years, mathematical research in Indonesia has experienced rapid development. From 
only 28 papers listed in Scopus in 2001 to around 1,500 papers in 2020. Many collaborations with association abroad have also been carried out. Reciprocal membership with AMS, American Med Society, European Med Society, and cooperation in the form of research workshop with SIMPA, SIMS, and others. Undergraduate education programs have spread throughout the provinces, but mathematical master's program is still concentrated in the few big cities only. And doctoral level education is still available very few and concentrated and concentrated in Jaffa. The quality is still very diverse and needs to be improved. These are the statistics of the research up output. There are at least 52% of journal articles. The number of mathematics articles is about 5% uh, of the total number of articles nationally. And this number is ranked 12 in Indonesia compared to other fields. Mathematics research activities have at least two orientations. First, scientific development, and uh, second, research oriented to solving local problems. The activities are very diverse, and fields developed are also quite broad. Quite broad. However, access and opportunities to conduct research are not the same. Lecturers who live in small or medium-sized universities have to fight extra hard to get this opportunity. Often the obligation to teach and contribute to management at his or her university has taken up his time. In addition, the availability of discussion partners and postgraduate student is a barrier in itself. A very big challenge in mathematical research is how to uh, improve the quality and how to make research opportunities uh, equal. In addition, how we can play an active role in developing mathematics at a global level and how to increase the usefulness of mathematics in answering local problems are also big challenges. At national level, the opportunity to obtain research funding is widely open. There are at least three institutions that offer research grant and postgraduate scholarship every year. One is Ministry of Education, and then BRIN, National Research and Innovation Agency, and LPDP, Indonesian Endowment Funds for Education. But most of them are offered competitively in various schemes. And this is hard for small universities to compete and win the grant. To improve the quality and equality in research, many collaborative research has been proposed between researchers from within and outside the country. Collaboration with the world best universities is also offered. For example, like with the top universities in UK, in Japan, and also in USA. Recently, the Ministry of Education also launched a new policy called uh, Merdeka Belajar Campus Merdeka. That means freedom to learn and uh, independent campus. This policy is giving students the freedom to take three semesters outside of their uh, study uh, program curriculum. Each semester of courses 
taken from outside their study curriculum and a maximum of two semesters outside their universities. There are eight activities can be done for this uh, program. Uh, one is uh, for teaching at school, internship, village project, research, and so on. This policy, of course, can stimulate collaborative research activities between student lecturers and between lecturers and create research based on local program, uh, problems and etc. In addition, the mathematic community has also organized many initiatives. The first initiative has been done through the implementation of SIM school, SIMPA school, workshops, conferences, and Indo MS schools. The second initiative can be done through organizing national level math competitions for students. And the third one has been done by organizing visiting professors program, workshops and distinguished lectures. And the last initiative can, uh, can be done through enhancing the role in curriculum reform for basic schools and university level. Thus, we have implemented several strategies and programs in an effort to improve the quality of research and equalize research opportunities. Of course, this has to be done consistently and it will take time for us to see the results. That's all from me. Thank you. Dan. The Black Heroes of Mathematics, or Do I Look Like a Boxer? Once upon a time, I was visited the Middle East and I was walking down the high street and I was surrounded by a large crowd of people. And they were asking me, was I the boxer? I am Mike Tyson, the former heavyweight champion of the world. My name is Nile Chamberlain and this is my story. I was born in, and raised in England uh, to Jamaican immigrants. And in my childhood, I was passionate about mathematics. And my dad would give me the motto, you don't need anybody's permission to be a great mathematician. This was my experience at home. However, I had a different experience at school. At school, when I spoke to my career teacher and I told him that I wanted to be a mathematician, he told me that I should become a boxer. Other teachers would, would show me books of mathematicians and say, you don't look like them. You don't look like a mathematician. However, I carry on believing what my dad said to me and went to the next level, next educational level of mathematics. Until I came to the time when I applied to do a PhD, I was invited to a certain university for an interview. And the professor took one look at me and said this, you are technically weak and naive if you ever think you can do a PhD in mathematics. At that point, that was a straw that broke my back. The final straw. I lost all my passion for mathematics on that day. I no longer regarded myself as a mathematician. How can I be a mathematician in a community that I didn't belong to, that didn't have no representation of me, and society and teachers were telling me that I could not be, could be a mathematician. Almost a decade later, when my son was four, he went to infant junior school and the teacher asked him, what did you want to be when he grew up? And Philip said he wanted to be a mathematician. This is what the teacher said to him. Philip, you will never become a mathematician, but you might grow up to become a singer. When I heard about this, I was very angry. I wanted to go to that school and give that teacher a piece of my mind. And then something occurred to me. The same discouragement that Philip received was the same discouragement that I received a number of years ago. But what did I do? I quit. I gave up. How can I be a role model to my own son? if I can't even pursue my own dreams. Then I remember 
what my dad said to me, you don't need anybody's permission to be a great mathematician. So from that day forth, I decided I was gonna be a mathematician. No more selling myself short, no more holding myself back, no more limiting myself. I was gonna be a mathematician. So I joined a company and I became a mathematical modeling consultant, solving real world problems all over Europe. But in parallel with that, I, I did a part-time PhD at Portsmouth University and the thesis was called Extension of the Gamma's Room Problem Played Over Networks. Now, not only did I get the PhD and become Dr. Nair Chamberlain, I was also had a successful career where I was named as one of the top 100 scientists in the UK. Around about 2015, I heard about a rumor of a film called Hidden Figures about three African-American female mathematicians who helped NASA during the space race. During my research, I found out that this was actually based on a true story about Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughan, Mary Jackson. But I realized that these mathematicians worked for NASA around about the same time that I was at school being told that I could not become a mathematician, that I should become a boxer. So that got me thinking. The film's called Hidden Figures. I was wondering, are there other hidden figures out there? Are there other stories of black mathematicians that have not been told? So I decided to start a social media poster campaign called The Black Heroes of Mathematics, where I would tell stories of black mathematicians. The first one is this sentiment. Francis William. Now, when he was a teenager, he was taken from Jamaica and taken to, to Britain as part of a social experiment to see whether blacks could actually survive in an educational establishment at Cambridge University. Now, not only did Francis William survive, he thrived and got a mathematics degree and went back to Jamaica to set up a mathematical school. And then there was this gentleman, Albert Cox. Well, while drop serving, um, his country during the First World War, he decided to apply for a PhD program in mathematics. Now, certain universities didn't recognize his PhD, but a university in Japan did. But why was this significant? Because in 1929, Albert Cox became the first black mathematician to get a PhD in mathematics in the world. And then this, this mathematician, Euphrain Loftus Hayes. Now, Loftus Hayes was female, she was in her 50s, and she was black, free on the representational groups. Now, in 1940, J.H. Hardy wrote a book called A Mathematical Apology, where he stated, no mathematician should ever allow himself to forget that mathematics more than any other art or science is a young man's game. Two years later, Euphrain Loftus Hayes got a PhD in mathematics, as showed despite coming from the three underrepresented groups, that mathematics is not just for the few, mathematics is for everybody. Now, in, 19, in 2020, there was the George Floyd incident. And as a response to it, four UK mathematical um, bodies approached me and we had a discussion about setting up a conference about black mathematicians and it was called Black Heroes of Mathematics. Now this conference was done successfully in 2020, it was repeated again in 2021 and will be repeated again this year in October 2022 and the objective of the conference is to showcase inspirational black role models contributions to the field of mathematics. I'm going to give you three examples of speakers who spoke at this conference. The first is Angela Tabari. Angela Tabari is a mathematician from Ghana and what she does, she sets up a network of mathematicians, female mathematicians, to transform the continent of Africa through mathematics. The second is Jude Kong. Now, Ju Kong, he works in artificial intelligence, machine learning and AI, and looked at strategies to track and come up with uh, other strategies to, to combat the spread of COVID in nine southern African states. And then there is Magefi Franken, who was the first female black mathematician to get a PhD in mathematical education. All 
inspirational role models or black heroes of mathematics. Once upon a time, I visited a city in the Middle East and as I was walking down the high street, I was surrounded by a crowded a crowd of people. And they was asking me, was I the boxer Iron Mike Tyson? My answer was no. My name is Professor Naira Chamberlain. And I am the immediate past president of the Institute of Mathematics and its application, the first black president of a British mathematical learned society. So my father was right. You don't need anybody's permission to be a great mathematician. This is my story. I'm Anjum Halai, a professor at the Aga Khan University, Pakistan, and I'm also the vice president of the executive committee of the ICMI. The topic for today is looking at diversity and inclusion in mathematics, but from a perspective of language. So my topic is language learning and mathematics. This year is the World Language, World um, Indigenous Languages Year, and UNESCO's uh, World Language Atlas says that there are more than 8,000 languages. You can see here the languages in the world, uh, all of them, these are the words of welcome. So uh, not all of the 8,000 languages are at equal status, but the point remains that there are so many different languages in the world. And as I will explain, language plays an important role in providing opportunity for learning. In mathematics, there is a very strong view that mathematics is a universal language of abstract symbols, signs, and therefore mathematics transcends culture. This is a very commonly held view. And therefore, very often in mathematics classrooms, the language of instruction is not the first or the second, sometimes not even the third language of the learners and the teachers. But increasingly, there is sustained and compelling evidence that learning mathematics is socioculturally embedded. And I have given the references of the research, the detailed references are given at the end of the slide. Language of instruction and the pro um, deeply impacts the processes of teaching, learning, and assessment in the classroom. In a study where I was, uh, in which uh, I participated, it was an extensive study of classroom observations in mathematics and science. We, uh, the students were learning, this was study set up in Punjab in Pakistan, and the students were learning mathematics in, a in English, which was the third language of the teachers and the students. And classroom interaction patterns showed that uh, students were very limited in, the, in the, the responses that the students gave were of a very limited nature, one word responses, very often repeating what the teacher had said, and their engagement with learning mathematics was not deep. It was only rote record. And there is evidence, again from UNESCO, that almost 40% of the children do not have access to an education in a language they understand, and this is negatively affecting their learning. And this is very much the issue of equity and diversity that I want to raise in the panel today. Assessment of learning, students are normally disadvantaged when they are assessed in a language other than the language they speak at home, because they cannot express themselves. They can, when they cannot express themselves, they cannot show what they have learned. In a study, um, my colleague uh, Rhea Dickens um, from Bristol University, they did an in-depth study of students who were learning uh, science and mathematics in a third language. And they, said, they showed that students demonstrated difficulties in the interpretation and understanding of examination questions, especially word problems. So students were not able to show what they had learned because they were finding it difficult even to understand what the questions papers were asking them to do. 
very often we see in large scale comparative studies such as the trends in international mathematics and science study which is which is a large scale cross country comparison of students achievement in mathematics and science in grade 4 and grade 8 and these studies have shown that children from linguistic minority or low socioeconomic are often among the low performers in mathematics I'll give you the example uh, from Pakistan. Pakistan participated in TIMS for the first time it participated in 2019. And the results showed that Pakistan, had, the students in Pakistan uh, at grade four had not achieved well uh, in mathematics. They had not done well at all. In fact, the country stood second from bottom. And uh, uh, an analysis of the students' profile showed that fourth grade students in Pakistan who speak the language of the test at home, there was a huge 36% uh, who never spoke the language of the test at home, and there was an additional 32% who sometimes spoke the language of test at home. Now you can imagine that these children were taking a test in a language which they were not they, they were not competent in. And um, if you look at the overall TIMS result, it showed that there were few students, only 5% at fourth grade, who on average never spoke the language of the test at home and had much lower average achievement in mathematics as compared to those students at fourth grade who had on average reported always or almost always speaking the language of the test at home. So what, is the, what do these TIMS results show? That language, language of learning and language of assessment is an intervening variable in where it comes to learning mathematics and students showing what they have achieved in mathematics. With this situation, how, what do we do to ensure that same opportunity is available to all students to demonstrate their skill and understanding? There is decades of evidence that learning is enhanced when teaching is in, their, in students' mother tongue or at least uh, the first six years of primary school before the second language or the global language of instruct, instruction is introduced. And uh, for example, UNESCO's mother tongue based bilingual education is a highly researched model which provides a way forward so that students are enabled to learn um, deeply uh, by building on the language that they bring from their home. My colleagues from Bristol University uh, did a research in East Africa where they explored language supportive pedagogy and textbooks to support students transition from their language, Kiswahili, to a national or a global language. And language supportive pedagogy and textbook showed that what are the ways in which students' language can be built upon, not denied, not suppressed, but built upon, and how you could create textbooks where students were able to build on the language that they brought from home. So providing students the opportunity to translate the, assess, uh, the other issue uh, besides the language supportive pedagogy and textbooks, Another uh, very useful way to enable the students to express what they have learned in mathematics, again this was Pauline Riyadikins and their study in Zanzibar, which showed that providing students the opportunity to translate the assessment items increases manifold the ability to understand and respond. So it's not that there are, not, there are no research based models of how you can enable the learners to use their language uh, in uh, meaningfully learning mathematics in the classroom. With those, uh, I close uh, the presentation and I look forward to the panel discussion and questions. I would add that the research that I have referred to is given in the reference list here. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Ekin Özman. I'm a faculty at Boğaziçi University, Istanbul, Turkey. And today I would like to talk about research collaboration conferences for women, in particular women in numbers example. 
Um, I want to thank the organizers uh, for, invite, for the invitation and for letting me speak about these initiatives. So the origin of the story uh, started uh, with these three women, Christian, Renata, and Rachel, uh, when they were in 2006, when they were at a conference uh, where they were, there were no women speakers. Um, and yet they could co come up with many names in between those three, uh, they could come up with many names who could be a speaker easily. Um, so they started to think about um, a collaboration workshop, uh, which will help uh, to improve the visibility of women um, in, in the number theory community. Uh, and I, this is a paragraph that I took from the application of uh, their uh, uh, workshop uh, for, the, for the grants. Um, and uh, here they uh, especially pay attention to two, two things, the lack of uh, women speakers in research conferences and the uh, low number of tenured female number theorists at the top research universities. So they described the goal of the workshop to increase these uh, this, these uh, numbers, both in terms of speakers and um, tenured tenure track uh, women faculty in number theory. So uh, is this really uh, a problem? Let's try to understand that uh that's a really an issue so many people may say that um, it's just a matter of time for the number of human faculty to reach uh what it's supposed to be like um this is a statistic that i took from ams uh, it shows the percentage of women phds and as you see and since the last 20 years it's more or less in the range of 30 percent so um this has been the trend for a while and that's why if it's just a matter of time we should see that around 30 percent of the uh, tenure tenure track women faculty uh the, the, the percentage of women faculty should be around 30% in the research uh, universities, but that's not really the case. It's more or less like 17% and it's even lower if you look at the um, top tier uh, research universities. So it's definitely not just a matter of time, something has to be done. Just waiting is not um, a solution by itself. So what was the format of Women in Numbers? The first one is 2008. Um, so there were about 40 people, uh, 40 women, uh, uh, which divided into eight project groups, each project group led by two leaders. Um, and uh, uh, they designed a project, a research problem to work on. Um, this problem was shared uh, with the group members ahead of time, a couple months ahead of the conference, and they started doing background reading. And then during those five days, the big chunk of the time was devoted to work on this problem. There were real field talks per day and most of the time group, the group gathered together and worked on their problem and after the workshop they continued their work and uh, within like six to nine months of the workshop um, a proceeding pay, uh, volume has been published um, with the papers research papers that came out uh, from these um, works so this was the first meeting, but of course it didn't stop there. It wasn't the aim, like the aim was to build a network. Um, so there were, so far, uh, eight conferences has, has been established, two is on the way. There were many special sessions and conferences in, uh, in cooperation, uh, seven proceedings has been published, and a directory of women in numbers has been established with a mailing list. So there's a webpage, womaninnumbers.org, where you can find a list of women number theories throughout the world. You can also add yourself to it if you want to. Um, so that that uh, serves as a as a resource for uh, for all mathematical community. And if you if you look at the list of these conferences that took place, women and numbers, um, they started with in uh, in Banff in North America. And every three years there is one in North America. And in 2013, uh, women and numbers Europe has started, and it's also taking place every three years um, since then. So geographically, there was an expansion, which was great. I hope this expansion continues uh, to the rest of the world. So the outcomes of this uh, initiative can be also um, summarized in numbers. Um, so far, there were more than 25 organizers. Each conference uh, was, had different organizers. There were more than 80 leaders and 200 participants. The survey that uh, was given to participants after the workshop uh, tells us very good um, feedback. Um, for example, most of the participants say that their experiences of, in terms of collaboration, the number of connections and the quality of those connections have either met their expectations or exceeded their expectations. So it's a very positive outcome from the participants. 
And it's not just these uh, feelings or the thoughts of uh, individuals uh, that uh, you know, proves the success of women in numbers. You can also look at the statistics. Um, the active woman number theorists increased a lot since the first establishment. Today, there are about 20 women in number theory higher than tenure track jobs at major research universities since 2008. And uh, all of them are uh, women in numbers alumni. Uh, the number of plenary women speakers at major conferences increased too. So these are a list of some major conferences in number theory. And the gray column shows the number of women speakers, uh, person, the ratio before 2008. And as you see, the ratio is increasing. Um, so this, these conferences are really helpful in terms of uh, increasing the visibility of um, uh, active re women researchers. Since Women in Numbers was such a success, um, many other research communities in other areas of math has been established since then. So this is a list that I took from AWM. As you see, it's a very big list, but it's not a, a, a full list. I don't claim that. This is just a list of uh, communities um, that took support from AWM, but there are many others like Women in Numbers Sage, for example. Um, so um, these initiatives has been established, uh, mostly, most of them are quite recent compared to women and numbers. Um, so AWM decided to measure how effective they are. They conducted a comprehensive study between 2015 and 20, and they asked the following question, is this a model that just feels good or actually are these uh, research conference, collaboration conferences for women really impact the women who participate in them? And moreover, do they impact broader mathematical, uh, mathematics community? So um, a study has been led by Aaron Lehe, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Arizona, and the outcomes are very promising. So I'm going to try to summarize some of the outcomes. It's a very extensive study, um, but let's, let's just try to um, highlight some of the outcomes. So what was the method, first of all, of this study? They uh, conducted several surveys. They also studied the CVs of the participants of each of these workshops to gather info about the job search outcomes, grant outcomes, uh, individual um, invite talks, uh, and letter leadership uh, roles that has been uh, achieved. They also analyzed uh, why Google scored the publication record of each participant. And here are some of the outcomes. The networking aspect, 93 of the respondents said that AWM network helped them grow their professional network. This is expected for junior participants maybe because they are you know, just new in the field, but it's true without, uh, I mean, it's true for any rank that um, they, the, the network has been um, expanded. For example, this is a quote from an assistant professor. Um, it says that she was able to hire a postdoc so the older, the more senior researchers um, was able to meet with the new generation uh, and it was a you know, networking opportunity for both sides. Idea generation, 86% agree that their networks help them generate new ideas and 69% receives, receives support for those ideas. Collaboration is obviously, this is the main uh, aim of this um, workshop and the participants, two thirds of them had more women collaborators after the workshop than they did prior to the workshop. Productivity, annual productivity rates increased for almost 75% of the participants. In terms of invited talks, the outcomes are also quite positive. 17 women received their first invitation uh, to give a research talk after their participation to a workshop. This is Virginia participants mostly, obviously. For more senior ones, uh, the women who already had a such experience, a health gave more talks per year after their participation to this to the, one of these workshops. And if you look at the plenary speakers at major research conferences, 28 women gave more plenary talks in that aspect. So absolutely, this has increased the visibility um, of women in their mathematical community. So that's a quote again from one of the participants, the one that is in um, italics. So as a summary, the analysis of survey and Google Scholar data tells us the rates of journal submission and publications are up. And the analysis of survey and CV data tells us that the women are progressing through the ranks, getting promoted, securing more research grants and becoming more visible in their scholarly communities. But of course, nothing is perfect. Um, this uh, workshop, uh, these, these initiatives also have some challenges, like they need to be more inclusive, both like um, support in supporting other um, minorities and also geographically, they can be more uh, inclusive. I hope this style is expanded to the rest of the world, not just North America or Europe, but um, Asia, Africa and the rest of the world. 
Another issue is that these conferences have very limited space. Like if you if you discount the group leaders and the organizers, there's hardly like 20 places left for the participants. And Women in Numbers, for example, uh, except, uh, receives more than 100 applications uh, per conference. So that's a problem. Um, but we cannot have more, like these conferences cannot be more frequent or uh, they can, that cannot be uh, more than uh, like 20 participants or more than like uh, 10 groups per, per workshop. It's hard. Uh, it's not impossible, but it's hard because each um, preparation of a research project, project is a lot of work and energy that is, uh, that is done by mid-carrier uh, women researchers. So if we we cannot make them force harder than they actually um, are uh, working. Um, another uh, challenge is the perception of proceeding papers and the attitudes of outsiders. So uh, some uh, think that the quality of these papers are not as high as the you know, normal um, journal publications. But I can assure you that, like, um, I'm sure it's the case for every other research collaboration conference, but for Women in Numbers, since I know it by, uh, through first-hand experience, uh, all the papers that have been submitted there has been refereed very carefully, and not all of them are accepted to appear in the proceedings. So we really pay attention to the quality of the papers a lot. So these are some challenges that needs to be addressed. Um, but in conclusion, the change is happening, but it's happening slowly. And it's not, it doesn't help if you just wait um, for the change to happen. Something needs to be done. And this is a research collaboration conferences is a first good start uh, in terms of this. However, uh, it's just a start. It's not the whole story. Uh, for example, we still have very few women in the top ed in the editorial boards for the top journals. That's an issue. The faculty positions at major research universities are not even close to 30% still. Um, from the data 2015 says that it's around 17%. So there's still room for improvement for sure. And research networks for women are affecting the careers of women mathematicians very positively. They are a good start. They should be improved and expanded to the rest of the world. Okay, thank you for very much for your attention. Um, and I would like to thank Michelle and Matilda for their help with the slides. I'm Marie-Françoise Roy. I'm the chair of the International Mathematical Union Committee for Women in Mathematics, and I'm also Emerita Professor of Mathematics in, in Rennes, in France. And today I'm going to talk to you about the gender gap in mathematics. So I've been trying to ask a few questions, which we are going to look at one after the other, and I hope also to, to bring a few answers and more questions. So the first is about uh, how many women have been lecturers at ICM, the International Congress of Mathematicians, in the past, and what is the current proportion at our virtual International Congress of Mathematicians in 2022? And in fact, uh, we've been studying this question with um, Elena Miyasevich already in 2018 for the Rio meeting. And uh, this is the number, the proportion, and also numbers of women who have been lecturers at ICM through the history of ICM, which is a little more than 100 years. And you can see that, uh, in fact, before the Second World War, there were quite a few women already lecturers at ICM, and then it stopped for nearly 50 years, and it started again around the 90s, and we can say that in this period, it's more or less growing, not always constantly growing, but um, say in the last, uh, during the three last ICM, we had a proportion which is uh, around 15% uh, of uh, women lecturers. And uh, so that's the situation for Rio, Seoul, and Hyderabad, about 15%. And for the virtual ICM, the proportion is over 20%. We don't know exactly, well, uh, when I'm talking now, which is before the beginning of, um, of ICM, we don't know uh, how many, um, what's going to be the, the final proportion, because it depends, of course, uh, whether they are or not. So. I am new medalist this year, which we know now, but uh, I still don't know when I'm talking. 
And um, okay, so one other question is what is the current proportion of women authors of mathematical research? And how did it change in the last decade? And in order to study that, uh, we had a methodology which was uh, to work uh, on a project called the Gender Gap in Science Project. It was an um, International Science Council funded interdisciplinary project, and there were three parts. What we call the Global Survey of Scientists, which was a, a questionnaire sent to scientists all over the world, men and women. A study of publication patterns, and then a study also of a database of good practices, a collection of database of good practices. Okay, so the project was uh, three years from 2017-2019 with uh, 11 partners, including IMU, which was leading the project with IUPAT, the people from chemistry. And then we had also um, astronomers, physicists, computer science, and so on. And we have still our website, so you can look at what we've been doing there. Okay, so let me come back to my to my question about the proportion of women authors of mathematical research. And uh, we have this uh, diagram, which uh, has been is based on an analysis of academic publications, millions of publications since 1970, which are in fact collected in the ZBMAT, which is the European uh, database for mathematical publication, and which is uh, Three, and this is a reason why it was possible for us to, to work with it. So the proportion has been growing basically from 10% to nearly 30% currently. And in the same period, the total number of uh, researchers in mathematics has grown a lot. So we can say that there are some kind of linear increase of the proportion of women publishing mathematics inside a very quickly growing population of uh, mathematicians, of active mathematicians. Okay, now if we are interested in the proportion of women authors in top journal in math, what the situation and how did it change? So again, with the same methodology, we were able to see that um, in 1970, the proportion of women was under 10% of top journals nearly in all possible the scientific topic that we've been looking at. So, But in 2020, there was a big change in astronomy, astrophysics, and chemistry because the proportion became around 20%, while it is still under 10% in mathematical, in mathematics, sorry, and theoretical physics. So it means the proportion of more women publishing mathematics is not reflected in the proportion of women publishing mathematics in top journals. Okay, now we can turn to other aspects, which is the, say, the way the, the women in mathematics are, are welcome and uh, maybe discriminated inside the community. So we wanted to know also is sexual harassment and discrimination towards women similar in mathematics and in other sciences. So we have many uh, data on this topic, but I choose to show you one diagram, which is about sexual harassment. So this is the total uh, population of scientists that answered to our survey. This is the proportion of people in mathematics, which is, of course, a subset of this. And now, inside it, we look at applied mathematics, which is also a subset of mathematics. And uh, we see that uh, there is a big, very big difference between female and male in all the three populations. There are many women, uh, nearly 30%, which say that they have personally experienced uh, sexual harassment, and very few men, around 3%. And their proportion is slightly better, if we can say so, in say mathematics and even also even slightly better in, uh, in uh, applied mathematics. But as you can see also, the, the basic scheme is the same for all the situations. So we can also wonder whether 
the mathematical community is more or less women friendly than the other scientific communities. And again, we have um, several uh, data that we can share, but we just consider one. So it's about the encouragement by neighborhood community of France. So basically people of the same environment, people of the same age and so on. And we can see that uh, this encouragement is always higher for male and for female, but it's reasonably high in the global uh, population, while in the mathematical population or in the applied mathematics population, we see that there is a bigger difference between male and female. Female are less encouraged by their friends than uh, male are and it's more or less uh, similar for applied mathematics. So it's really something to, to think of, I believe. Okay, so now a more difficult question is how to define and promote best practices. So it's not simple, but we thought one possible approach was to uh, collect a database of good practices. So I'm not going to give you the details, but you can look at these uh, initiatives on uh, the uh, website of, uh, of our project. In fact, on CWM website. So in general, in fact, uh, the references for all these uh, studies are the Gender Gap in Science website or the CWM website where we have the database of good practices. We have a book, which we call the Gender Gap in Science book, which has been, uh, it appeared in February 2020. We can, you can download it for free uh, on this uh, Zenodo depository, or you can also uh, order it for a print on demand uh, for a reasonably low price if you want to have it as a book. And we've been also um, designing the Gender Gap in Science booklet which is a summary of the project in eight pages, which is also containing all the recommendations of the project. And we have it in several languages, in English, French, German, Spanish, as well as two versions of Chinese. And if you want to translate it in another language, uh, you are very welcome. And uh, please contact us uh, to translate it in, uh, in, your, in your favorite language. And uh, finally, I want to say that after the end of the project, we thought it was very important to keep up the network. So we organized a permanent structure, which is called the Standing Committee for Gender Equality in Science. We started with nine founding unions, and the uh, IMU, International Mathematical Union, was one of them. But now we are up to 20 uh, international organizations, basically members of the International Science Council, and also including social sciences like um, psychology, for example. And all together, we are trying to reduce uh, the gender gap in science and reach uh, gender equality in science. Thank you. So now I, I'll pass my button to Edri. So please lead the discussion. Hello, welcome to Edwin. Um, I'm Ed Ray Goins, and I'm on the Committee for Diversity um, here in the United States. Um, let me maybe start just with a very general question for the panel here, and you can answer this however you want. What do you think is um, at least one pressing issue for diversity in the mathematical community? I mean, I can go first if that's okay. Right. I think one pressing um, issue is this idea that, you know, talent is evenly distributed but opportunity isn't. I mean, yes, that's true with the whole society, but certainly for the mathematics community specifically, yeah. And this whole idea that when we look at, for instance, who are the mathematicians that would win the film medal? Who are the mathematicians that 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 write the most uh, significant um, um, papers? And they all tend to be a certain type. And that has, you know, you, you know, when people look at that and they actually mirror that saying, who are the mathematicians of the future? Are the mathematicians of the future supposed to be the same type? That's a, that's the challenge that we need to get, get over, is this, this whole idea that talent is evenly distributed, but opportunity isn't. And we, somehow that's, that's a major barrier, barrier that we need to get over. 
maybe I, I would like to to add to, to, to Naira's comment that uh, unfortunately I think there is uh, there is a misbelief that uh, that uh, that that mathematics is uh, it's it's uh, it's completely uh, objective um, subject. I mean the the, the, the subject is, is is objective, but we are human beings and we are we are subject. To, uh, to to our environment, to 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 um, to, to what happens uh, around us, to our our bias and our uh, our internal prejudices, and I think it's very important that we understand that we have to uh, to deal with these issues uh, also in, within the mathematical community, and that we carry everything that we have uh, that we have lived with us when we when we do mathematics and we when we. Uh, we interact with our with our peers. Uh, one of the problem is uh, uh, to access the opportunity to learn, uh, especially uh, with uh, people live in uh, in uh, village or in, in in remote area and so on. So uh, sometimes it's hard to uh, manage. To get uh, equality, uh, equal uh, opportunity to learn. Yeah, that's all. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, if we if we look at the history of uh, the involvement of women in mathematics, we see that in fact they've been participating a lot at various moments in history, including, of course, in uh, say in Greek times with uh, uh, Hypatia, for example. But there is a way in which it seems that it's never remembered, that uh, it's forgotten. So I was struck also, I mean, when I was looking at this uh, Nira uh, presentation, that mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, you are look, talking about all these black heroes of mathematics, but most people don't know that they exist. And for us also, we, we are very, in, interested in um, in women heroes in mathematics and in black women heroes in mathematics as well because uh, mm. of the intersectionality. But I see that this is a very important uh, fact that people are forgotten again and again. And then there are some, so it, it's kind of building invisibility for some of the communities. Yeah, yeah thank you. And I mean, I think it's hard to choose one issue globally um, mm. because um, the diversity, the word diversity means different things uh, to different people around the world. Mm. Like um, it, it has a different meaning in, um, for example, South America, uh, and it has a different meaning in Turkey, um, where I'm from. So for example, in Turkey, um, I think um, accessing to, uh, you know, modern math, like, um, or, accessing to current hot topics, uh, current research topics is not equally distributed um, around uh, the country. Like in rural parts, it's harder okay. um, to reach um, the modern resources. Language is also, can be a barrier. Um, so um, diversifying, I think in, 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 in my country may mean, you know, uh, including everybody. Um, who has, um, you know, uh, weaker resources too. Um, but I mean, it, it, I mean, I I got my education, my PhD education at least, and um, I worked a while in the states. Um, it has a different meaning there because the resources are better distributed, maybe not equally distributed, but much better distributed compared to other places. Um, and there, um, it might mean. Um, gender-wise, like or um, other like um, other identities uh, can mean uh, you know uh, inclusion, including them, uh, may may be the most important problem currently. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, for all of that. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of different directions we can take this, so so we'll we'll try our best to kind of see what we can do here. Um, let's maybe talk about this question of access. Um, you know mm -hmm. that that there are different levels of resources in the different countries that we're all in. Um, 
Can each of you say a little bit about this question of access? Is it a question of maybe the background that you come from? You know, if you have parents that were mathematicians, is it a matter of economically that the country may not have enough resources to have people to do research? Or is it a matter of maybe even culturally that mathematics isn't really that important of a thing and that we really should encourage people to go into other other disciplines. Um, so can maybe some of you touch on the question of access to doing mathematics? So uh, in, in our situation, uh, access to have uh, better teachers in mathematics is uh, in most most uh, area in Indonesia is also, it's, it's still a, uh, quite a problem because uh, uh, the education of the uh, teachers is still, uh, I mean, uh, not uh, so uh, high standard. Yeah, so we we still have uh, problems in uh, uh, improving the quality of the teachers, uh, particularly in mathematics. So access are uh, having uh, good teachers, having uh, good school uh, environment uh, for learning. I think that's one of these. Uh, problem, uh, main problems, yeah. Well, Eddie, to maybe um, try to delve into that a little bit more, um, do you feel that, is there enough um, financial resources to pay teachers? Do you think that there needs to be more money allocated towards the education system? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I, uh, the commitment of the governments uh, into a science and mathematics education uh, year by year is uh, more uh, increasing, but it's but it's need more <laughs> to to have uh, better better teachers and better uh, education on mathematics and science, and uh, we have uh, uh, quite a problem with a geographical uh, area in Indonesia. I think that's also uh, one of the. Uh, uh, challenges, yeah, to to have that, yeah, to do that. Um, I can go next if that's okay, right? I mean, um, yeah, just uh, concurring with the previous speaker. You know, in the United Kingdom, um, access is more to do with yeah, economics. Where what you find is that. Um, a lot of the resources, you know, in terms of teacher quality, you know, the, the high end uh, mass teachers tend to be not going to those schools in a in a inner city or the poorer economical regions of uh, of the of the country. And even uh, and I even widen it out when you, when you're talking about, let's say, mass communicators that would actually go out and you know go to schools to uh, tell them tell the pupils about the joys of, of mathematics. They tend, which schools do they tend to go to? Do they, do they go to the inner city schools or do they go to the more high-end high -end schools? Tends to go to the more high-end high schools. Now, that's why how it was definitely, you know, let's say five years ago, it's changing and it's changing slowly where there's a recognition that's saying, guess what, we should be going to all, all schools and recognizing, you know, actually there are, there, are, there, are, there are kids out there who in these inner city uh, regions, they want to do mathematics. And sometimes, you know, like I've been going there doing mass communications, I really find it surprising that they don't teach mathematics there beyond the age of 16. So again, that is an also an access um, uh, um, a barrier where all of a sudden, if they really want to do mathematics, they have to go to another school and then have to go for another, an interview or in front of people that don't, don't even know them. So again, that is a ch that's challenging in those in those schools in the inner city schools. They tend to only teach mathematics up to sixteen, and then that is it. Um, Naira, can I maybe follow up with that? Um, when you're interacting with the students there at the schools, what's their opinion of mathematics? Do they think it's it's something interesting? Is it something that they do want to learn more about? But what do the students think? I mean, when I am, um, um, you know, as a, you know, one of my roles is, let's say, a mass communicator. Um, one of the first things I did when I went to school, first time I went to school, I was telling them all about mathematics, saying, here's all the mathematics. And at the end of the, uh, the, the hour talk, the, one of the pupils uh, put up their hand up to me and says, sir, can you tell me what's the point of mathematics? So I completely lost them. And so what I had to do was I had decided from then on, I had to deal with the elephant in the room. I have to tell them what is the point of mathematics? Why is mathematics relevant? Why is mathematics is important? Once I, I could sell that, what mathematics is right at the point, then there was, the mind was open and then they could actually see 
all the beauty of mathematics. So again, it's that, that challenge of how is mathematics presenting? You know, it's, mathematics is presented in a way saying sine, cos, tan. Why do we need to use this? And the teachers say, because I says so. Then that's not going to, it's not going to work. You know what I mean? So they have to relate and engage it. And then they will see the whole beauty of, of mathematics. Right. Yeah. yeah thanks. Let, let me maybe ask a, a slightly different question based on all of this. And, and please, anyone feel free to jump in and answer. Um, it, it seems that a lot of us here really do care to diversify the field of mathematics by trying to encourage women and minorities to go into the field. Um, what are some pushback that we might hear from women or from minorities, like along the lines of what Naira is saying, that where sometimes people wonder, is mathematics useful? Is mathematics something that, that is gonna be interesting? Um, are there other issues that you might be hearing from women or minorities that are saying, I don't wanna do mathematics for whatever reasons? So if I can say something. Yes. Oh, <clears throat> I believe that uh, one, uh, one important aspect uh, is also the, uh, say, I would say the atmosphere of the mathematical community. I mean, are women feeling welcome? Are they discriminated? Are they sexually harassed sometimes? And this might be a way also of pushing them away from the community. Maybe not directly through their, say, uh, the results in mathematics, but maybe by feeling that this atmosphere is not something that they like. They would prefer to go to other places where maybe there are more women, it's more women friendly, it's more family friendly and things like that. That's what we've been uh, seeing in, uh, in our gender gap study, that this aspect is very important in fact. And I believe uh, it's also the case for other minorities. It's not only, uh, of course, women are not a minority <laughs> uh, because we are many, but inside the community, we, we, we are a minority. And, uh, and I think, uh, I think changing the women-friendly or diversity-friendly atmosphere in the community is something very crucial. So Marie Francois, if I can then follow up with that a little bit. Um, the feelings of women say being sexual harassed or not feeling welcome, do you think that that happens at all levels of doing math, maybe starting in school, becoming a professor? Is it worse at some levels versus others? Well, it, of course, it really depends also on, uh, on the different uh, countries and different situations. But I believe it's certainly already the case in high school, mm -hmm. uh, where there is really a problem of identification for young girls. Do they feel that if they like mathematics, they are going to be, say, popular, they are going to be well considered, they are going to be accepted. And then it's, it's going on, I guess, at every possible uh, level in the uh, in the future. Maybe once people are really accepted, they have a permanent position and so on, maybe it's less the case. But I think at least in the period of youth, when people are growing, I think it's, uh, it's really plays uh, an important role. Ekin or Carolina, do you want to chime in? I was just gonna add, um, I think one reason that uh, the, it may not be too appealing um, to younger generations is the lack of uh, role models or mentors. If you don't see somebody who resembles you, who has succeeded in any field, in the field that you're, you might get into, you think that you don't have a chance or um, it, doesn't, it doesn't even occur to you that you can, uh, you know, climb the ladder. Um, if you, if the only if in case of women, let's say female uh, mathematicians you see are high school teachers, you don't even think about becoming a university professor. Um, mm -hmm. So that might be one thing. Good point. Good point. Mm -hmm. Tatiana, I see you have your hand raised. Good morning. Um, I may add that sometimes the lack of seeing mathematics as a relevant component or relevant way to contribute to the community is one of the deterrents. Um, there are studies that show that both women and people in underrepresented groups are more inclined to go into areas where 
they see how they could contribute to communities later on. Um, there's a, if I may quote, there is a study done uh, years ago by somebody who's the current president of the a psychologist where they follow kids who in the US took a test that's um, their SIT tests is an entry test for college. They took it at age um, in middle school. So when they were five years from being tested and they look at the kids who did better and then uh, in mathematics, and then they follow them through until after graduation, um, a few years after graduation. And so most of the boys went into STEM fields. Um, and although the girls went into many different fields, the more prevalent field was uh, law. And when asked why, it's because they, they felt that that was the place where they could contribute the most. So if we don't make mathematics relevant to the communities, we might not be able to attract people. Naira, please. Right. Um, I'm going to add to that. I'm going to extend it a bit more, where I'm going to say, talking about uh, the sort of called stereotypical threat. Now, so let's say me as a mathematician, if I go and do mathematics and fail at it, do I actually confirm uh, a stereotype about, you know, black people or minorities or underrepresented group uh, that, guess what? I failed at mathematics. So surely I've proven that we can't do mathematics. And stereotypical threat is a, is a real issue and is out there. And even when I'm, you know, if I do, let's say, uh, lessons to those who want to go to, let's say, Oxford and Cambridge, you know, the top universities and they are minorities, that's still there. They're thinking, oh, am I, you know, am I good enough? And if I fail, not only do I, is it represent me, I'm represented my, my whole community, you know, we showed that we all fail. So sterical typical threat is a, is a real thing. So yeah, that's my contribution. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Cheryl. Your hand was raised. Hi, yes, thank, thank you. I, I'm really disappointed that Anjan Hala is not here because she was the one that talked about the influence of language and feeling comfortable yeah. in the language of tuition. Mm -hmm. But we have several people here who, who might be able to comment about that. I mean, I, I was doing um, quite some work with uh, colleagues in, in Thailand quite a number of years ago and their priorities had to be to um, translate books into Thai rather than being doing cutting edge research. And yeah, so, yeah. I mean, that was the best thing they could do for their country and, and raising yeah. the mathematical level and uh, education of mathematics there. I just wondered what uh, yeah. others with more uh, experience might, might have to say about that issue. Yeah. Uh, uh... <laughs> I think uh, by uh, using a uh, mother language uh, to learn mathematics is, uh, will be much uh, efficient because uh, uh, we can we can I mean we can think uh, in the <laughs> uh, in the natural uh, natural way uh, to learn mathematics. So uh, yeah, I, I I agree that uh, by uh, translating the uh, uh, mathematics uh, books into local language will help the students to uh, learn more uh, and to uh, to deepen uh, uh, their uh, knowledge in mathematics more easier. Yeah. So, so I I, I agree with uh, Cheryl about this, and and I think uh, some of uh, countries. Uh, uh, have, uh, uh, I mean, proof uh, in translating these uh, books into uh, science and mathematics into uh, their own uh, language and uh, show that this is uh, uh, able to increase the uh, understanding and the knowledge of mathematics and science. Yeah. Right, right, thanks. Maybe yes, I, could, I can add that also in, in Brazil, I think it, was, it has been very important for the development of, uh, of mathematics in Brazil that we have a huge literature in Portuguese. 
So in, oh, in our, okay. and, and going back a little bit to the previous question. So in Brazil, we have a, we have a mixed system. We have a both public schools and private school. And mm -hmm. this, And this reflects actually the, 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 the big inequality in Brazilian society. So the public schools are usually, most of them are of, uh, of worse quality than the private schools. So uh, mm -hmm. usually, as soon as a family is able to, they will send their, their kids to a private school. And so you can imagine uh, a, a big difference in education and, and access to, to, to mathematics. And, and also, for instance, also for learning uh, foreign language. So usually at the, at the private schools, you will have a better, uh, with few exceptions, uh, you will have better uh, access to mathematics and to, and to English. So most, most educated people will, will, uh, will know, uh, but most people that would go to a public school will, have a, will, will not have this opportunity. And, and, and so, Answering both questions, so in, in Brazil, I think that this, there is a, an economical uh, a barrier that prevents people from, from getting access to, to, to very good education. And, uh, and also the, the importance of, of, of having uh, literature in, uh, in, 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 the, in the basic language. Yeah, well, this does bring up um, some, some really good questions. You know, we started today by talking about opportunities that the people do have to doing mathematics. And now we're getting into resources. Are there things that maybe our governments or that our professional societies can do to help bring the resources that some of our colleagues need? So say, are there specific things that we think that our societies can do, you know, for our colleagues in countries that maybe don't have access to internet? Yes, I mean, um, you know, let's say two years ago, uh, we started uh, in, in the United Kingdom, uh, the Mathematics Society of the United Kingdom, we started a conference called the Black Heroes of Mathematics, where you was, you're so kind to do, do a talk, Adre. And, um, but after when we uh, had, let's say, our workshop meeting, we found out that there was actually challenges from our delegates in, in Africa, where they were saying, actually, we're having data issues, um, you know, connection and, and data issues. So one of the things that we we, we, we did and we, we, we actually funded was to actually have, let's say, work parties, or watch parties, sorry, in, in, in certain centers in Africa, where we actually would fund, fund data and we'll have all the, The, all the groups can actually come to come together to watch the, the next conferences. So that, that's let's say one thing that they're doing. Now I'm not saying it's an absolute perfect solution, but it's an example where you know sometimes we we, we have to actually identify what went well, what didn't go well, and actually address it. You know, if accessibility is is an issue, then address it because you know we would just you know the whole meaning of the conference would be meaningless if we didn't address this, issues like that. Yeah, yeah, good point. Good point. Any other comments on this? To, to, to establish this, uh, uh, say, um, uh, website uh, connections, for example, is really important. We started to do that in Africa for the African uh, Women in Mathematics Association. And it's really a very useful uh, tool to, to connect uh, people. And we, we started at a global level and then we had many uh, national organizations that started to, to grow. And uh, also I think we can mention the Simba schools. I know that Eddie um, uh -huh. is mentioning them in, uh, in his uh, presentation. Yeah. And it's also a way as exactly as also Naira was saying that we can, maybe people are isolated uh, in various universities, but if you can already bring them together in a good place in their own country where they have a better connection, and then they can also have some physical uh, contacts, uh, then I think it's, it's a good way to, it's very difficult to, to bring everybody to a given place, I don't know, in, in the US, but to bring people together in, in their own country to, to have some kind of, uh, of sufficient, uh, mass of people and then there create a connection with outside. I think this kind of hybrid combination is very, very good. And, uh, and that's what we are trying to do also when we have this uh, kind of regional meetings for women. Like I was mentioning Gabon, for example, the women from Gabon wanted to create a network for women in their country, but there are very few. And then they 
we, we gave them the opportunity to invite uh, women from Cameroon and from Congo. And then they could have a kind of regional meeting. And from there, we were in contact with them. And that's how things are, are going. So I think that's uh, very efficient, I think. Tatiana. So, um, you made me think because of the conversation. MSRI is running a, a pilot program this year. Partially, it's COVID motivated. Um, we had summer schools. We have a large number of summer graduate schools. And one was going to be in Australia and the other one was going to be in Italy. And what we had concerns about sending students there and then not being able to re-enter the U.S. And so we have established satellite locations. So the U.S., the students coming from North America attending the Australia summer school, winter school in their case, will be going to Hawaii. And um, there will be, so there will be a site in Hawaii, there will be a site in Australia that helps with the time difference. And um, there will be activities in both, they will coordinate, but they will be located differently. And the same thing, the Italy will be in New York. And so this is something that maybe we could explore in terms of um, along the lines of what Francois was saying, to have like the women in having conferences that have a satellite somewhere where people can come together and um, it's a model we also were discussing with IBM in terms of doing summer schools that are at some of the sites where IBM has locations. But it's for us, it's just a pilot right now. Yeah, that's for us now. Uh, Sophie, would you like to speak? Your hand is up. Welcome. Yes, um, thank you. So, sorry for arriving late. I was uh, in a different con in another conference. Um, just would like to give a couple of words of um, um, an event we are organizing um, in Senegal. Uh, this event is, has been initiated by uh, the CDC of European Mathematical Society I'm chairing, uh, and when Marie Francoise is also a member, uh, M Senegal, the African Institute for Mathematical Science, and SIMPA. And also ICTP is, um, is, is joining the team. And then this is a, let's say a first kind of African training research school. I'm going to share the link on the chat so you can see. We try to organize by um, um, uh, focusing first on two thematic, one in applied math probability and statistic and one in, uh, in PDE. And then um, we hope that next year we can do it in a different place uh, in Africa. Mm. And it may mm. be also in other places in the world, uh, in other thematic, mathematical thematic, uh, thing like that. So we would like to be, to, to have something uh, that may happen at least once per year in a different location in Africa or uh, other places. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, it's really interesting. Okay. Okay. Then this, this, okay, this may be dedicated to master student, but also um, PhD student, and then a follow up uh, during three years by a mentoring uh, will will be um, possible. Well, I actually do want to try to shift gears here. Um, you know, we have maybe about I don't know twenty minutes left or so, and I want to start to think about the future of of a lot of what we're working on. Um, there's a lot of definitions, terms that are changing. In, in a lot of our work. Um, for example, one thing I wanna ask about is traditionally we're interested in issues dealing with women, but now there are various genders that we have to really rethink with a lot of these. Um, you know, so the question of being either transgender or the question of just really not having a gender at all. Um, I'm wondering for those that are involved very specifically with women in mathematics, um, how are your organizations, how are your activities maybe changing now that we do have to think about individuals that may want to be involved that are transgendered um, or issues dealing with just not having gender at all? How, how are your organizations dealing with these changing definitions of gender? Uh, maybe I could, I could start by, by saying that uh, for uh, for people coming, say, for, from Latin languages, uh, like like myself, like Portuguese or Spanish or, or French, this is a much harder question because the language itself uh, has gender. So I find this uh, extremely difficult to even 
phrase uh, some some uh, some things in a way that is it's absolutely inclusive, just by because there is no word for that. So I think we must also be ready for 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 a change in language if we really want to uh, to to welcome and to include. Um, everybody and this is, and this is already a difficulty some people seem not to be uh, ready to to accept uh, a change in language so we we've had uh, in, in, uh, in Brazil recently we had uh, uh, there, there was a conference that it was in fact uh, the first uh, conference uh, for black mathematicians and uh, that was organized last year and and the organizers uh, announced that the um, the conference in, in using an invented language that would be more inclusive for uh, both men and women and, and, and add any other uh, possible gender or identification. And they were uh, very much criticized and because they were supposedly using a wrong language. So I think this is already, uh, this is the first barrier to, uh, to address this, uh, this issues. Yeah, I, I do want to come back to that, but I want to let Robert speak. He, he has his hand up. Uh, I was just going to comment, uh, it, it, even in English, which is not strictly gendered, you know, there was a lot of resistance at first to using they as a, as a nonspecific singular pronoun. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, at first, at first uh, many people said, oh, you can't do that. That's just terrible. And, uh, and there was a, you know, uh, but gradually, because there really wasn't any other common solution that people, uh, that people felt uh, would work, it, it won out just by evolution. People started using it because there was no better alternative. And uh, so I, I think you're right. We do have to be uh, willing to be a little bit uncomfortable with uh, non-traditional uses of language because we're dealing with a non-traditional situation now. And, uh, and it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's not completely accepted everywhere now, but it's pretty much non-controversial non now in, in uh, at least in the US. I, don't, I can't speak for uh, Britain. Uh, or other English speaking countries. But, uh, but I think most places in the US people recognize they as a singular pronoun now. Um, Cheryl, I think you had your hand up next. Oh, yes, um, I think we're still learning and we don't quite know how to do it yet, but certainly there are some uh, women in maths prizes uh, by societies in Australia and, and academies, which are now um, for anyone who identifies as a woman. So that doesn't include everything, but at least it's a step and we're, tr we're still searching for the right way of the right words and the right concepts and the right inclusivity. And I don't know what's happening in other countries. Yeah, thanks. Tatiana? Thank you. So let me, um, I'll give a practical answer first about how MSRI is dealing with some. So we had some programs that are mostly a, um, aim at women and we, our description has changed, aimed at women and gender expansive individuals. So this was a, an easy way to address that. I mean, it's not a deep way, but it was a way. Um, the other one I wanted to say having to do with Robert's comment and they, um, at least in mathematics to address. I would love if every single recommendation letter written in this country talk about they rather than he or she. I wonder how much bias we could eliminate by simply doing that. Um, I really, if it were a recommendation of the AMS, that would be wonderful. Or if it could be changed immediately to, <laughs> to a neutral pronoun, I think the effects could be very positive. Yeah, yeah, Tatiana, along those lines, um, I've been on various NSF panels the last couple of years, and they've been making a very serious push that when the panel reviews the proposal, that we should remove all mention of pronouns in the panel's review. So it should only be the PI says, the PI does, but we shouldn't say he says or she says. So I know NSF has been really big about that the last few years. If we want to be universal in the, the sense of having many countries involved in our activities, like for example, the, the CWM, as uh, Carolina is mentioning in her, 
in our presentation, we, we have now uh, what we call CWM ambassadors from more than 100 countries. And in these countries, the uh, legislation and even perception of people about these issues is, can be very, very different from one country to another. There are like countries you know, like Germany, for example, who's accepting the idea that there are several genders and they still are countries where there is a lot of discrimination uh, uh, against, uh, I don't know, say homosexuality, for example. Uh, and uh, so if we, if we want to, so we, we had this issue when we, we were dealing with this uh, gender gap uh, project where we wanted to, to have a questionnaire going really to all places in the world in many different languages. And then we, we had this discussion. Do we ask people whether they are male, female, and what else? I mean, how do we, do we deal with that? And finally, I didn't know because I, I, I knew that it, it would be really difficult to have some say, solution that, that is acceptable for everybody all over the world. I think it's a very different situation. So I, I asked UNESCO what they are doing, and they said what they, they do is uh, something like three options, male, female, and prefers not to answer. And this seems to be acceptable all over the world, even in countries where it's kind of forbidden to be something else. So I think we, we need to remember that, uh, say, Europe is something, the US is something, but that there are really a lot of other situations in the world. And then we need to, to, to accept all of them, I think in order, of, I mean, to accept the people in all these various uh, situations. But, uh, but and, and also, of course, in France, we have the same issue as uh, Carolina mentioned, that our language is very much uh, gendered and we don't have a solution like they. So we have some solution that people like or don't like and we call it inclusive writing and how to, to make it clear that when we, when we write something, we want to include everybody. So, but it's not, uh, it's not very simple. Right, right, no, I understood. Um, I, I wanna put my friend Naira here on, on the spot for a moment. Um, I, I'm, I wanna ask, try, try to ask the same question, um, not for gender, but for race and ethnicity. Um, I know one thing I struggle with is the definition of what does it mean to be black if you're in other countries. I think I have a pretty good idea of what black means in the United States, but I really don't know what it means, let's say in, in the, the UK. Um, so, so Naira, because you know, you've been running this um, Black Heroes of Math conference for several years now, um, what are some of the issues that you might be seeing in the UK, or you could say more generally in, in other countries that you've been to with defining the word black? Are you seeing that that is problematic, that that's very different as you move from country to country? Yeah, I mean, even even within the, let's say, the United Kingdom, uh, let's say it's, itself, I mean, the, the term black, I mean, what does that, does that mean? Does that mean uh, those who are from uh, immigrants from Africa, from the Caribbean, and then, then, then there's a whole question of, but there's immigrants that came to the United Kingdom at the same time, they're from uh, India and Asia that will, will say, well, actually, guess what? We're black, and I say, but you're Asian, and sometimes no, we're black, and then sometimes we're having this challenge of saying, well, what is black, and and then they say, well, I'm black, but uh, guess what, my my grandfather is is, is Australian or Irish, uh, and and uh, <laughs> you, you get into that little description, and all of a sudden someone says, well, guess what, um, my um, going back, you know, my grandmother, grandmother, grandmother was from Africa, so surely I'm black. So we get into that challenge. Sometimes we just have to be sensible and saying. This is what we mean, and and away and away and away we go. I mean, I even had one time I had this author that came up to me, and he looked at, he looked like Robert, and he says, "Hello, I'm Jamaican," and I'm like, "Okay, so you're black." And so away we go. So uh, it, it, we just have to be, you know. Sometimes we just have to be sensible and say, "This is where they come from." And in terms of, let's say, the black heroes of mathematics, we are we state what our definition is, and then and then we just move move with it. But that's that's how we do it. But we recognise because of the history of the United, the United Kingdom, we do recognise that there are groups that's come from, you know, come from Africa, come from come from the West Indies, and we have made it specifically. That's what you know. That's what we will focus on. But 
whoever ever whoever makes the case and we're saying yeah they can they can speak and they can speak so you know it's not a it's not a draw a big line of saying this is what's black and not sky is black but we know what this what this conference is all about yeah yeah no that that, that is great um along those lines um carolina you mentioned earlier that there was a black mathematicians conference in brazil and, and I wanted to, to pose the same question to you. Um, are there complications with what does it mean to be black in Brazil? Um, actually, it, it is a, it is very, it seems that it's very different than in other countries. So race in, in Brazil is something that is self-declared. So there, there is no definition like in terms of, uh, of, of ethnicity or, 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 or origin. But in a sense, it's a whatever people declare. But of course, this is a very this is a uh, brings many many complications. For instance, now we have lots of affirmative actions, for instance, to get to universities or other other positions where people uh, where there are special special places for people for, from underrepresented uh, groups, and then has been cases where people that are say clearly not uh, black they declare themselves to be black in order to get uh, to, to, to profit from this. And then, and you, you know, legally afterwards, there are many, uh, many situations. So I think this is, this is indeed a very delicate, uh, uh, delicate situation because it is something that in Brazil that is self-declared, but, but we understand that this should be something that is, uh, that, that it somehow it, it represents uh, your identity. Uh -huh. Right, right, makes sense. Um, so let, let me ask maybe a, a very general question to, to the group here, because um, I think that Marie Francois touched on this a little bit. Um, you know, for a lot of us that are doing this work of inclusivity, we'd like to know some of the numbers so that we can have some metrics to know, are we having more women to be involved with getting their PhDs to becoming professors? more people of certain ethnicities, certain races and religions that are also being more involved in mathematics. But there is, there are some issues sometimes of gathering this data, that there might be pushback of those to say that don't want to fill out the certain forms or maybe mm -hmm. countries that say it's kind of illegal to ask for this information. Do you see, or maybe can you share your thoughts on the future of us gathering the information about our constituencies and how we might run into some trouble moving forward. Uh, maybe I, I can say again about the, the experience that I recently had in, in Brazil. So in Brazil, we have this, uh, this difficulty, uh, especially with race. Um, this is something that we've been trying to address, but there's very little data. So even in my institute, uh, I wanted to see how we were doing. So I wanted to see the statistics of, uh, of, uh, you know, of, of, uh, of diversity uh, within our students. And there is no such data. And the at no place a student can declare, for instance, their race. And, and there are, and, and so I recently organized the, the Brazilian Mathematical Colloquium. And, uh, and I, I would like in the registration form that people, whoever, wanted to that could, could declare their, their, their race and this would be used for, for a further study. And in the end, this was possible, but even legally, this was not something easy to allow people to declare uh, their, their race. So I think there, um, I, I had to make some effort and actually to, to, in order to, 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 to make this possible, uh, but it, I mean, the, this must, the solutions must be, must be thought after in, in order to, to to do this right right marie francois yeah uh, in fact i wanted to ask robert because he, he mentioned that uh, you are trying to collect data from the people who register at icm and i am really very curious to to know what kind of uh, what kind of information you are asking because uh, for example, in France, uh, asking for the race of someone would be illegal. Mm. So what, what are the questions you, you are asking in this, uh, <laughs> in this question? <laughs> I, I can answer uh, at least part of this. We did, in the questions that we submitted to, uh, to the EC, and, and they told me that they feel free to modify or select whichever questions they feel are appropriate or not appropriate, and that's fine. Uh, we didn't ask for any, uh, you know, for, for 
for example, racial data. We did ask some questions, but there was always a prefer not to state, as you had mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, it seems that that's the only, uh, I mean, you, you really have to allow for that. And, uh, and of course, it makes it really difficult to, to, uh, to draw any statistical conclusions, but it, it can at least give you a sense of what is out there. And uh, uh, it, there's a similar problem in the U.S., you know, uh, in the, there's a, uh, uh, for since 1995, I guess, there's been an LGBT caucus in the, uh, in the American Mathematical Society. And, uh, and so there's, uh, you know, some set of people who are willing to publicly identify, uh, but a much larger set of mathematicians who are uh, sexually and generally diverse minorities uh, who are not, who don't feel safe publicly identifying. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, there always has to be this, uh, you know, prefer not to, not to answer. Uh, but there are, there are beginning to be conferences, uh, which are in some sense analogous to the, the uh, uh, women in mathematics conferences, uh, LGBT uh, mathematicians getting together to talk about mathematics. Uh, and, that, you know, there's no such thing as LGBT mathematics, per se, I don't think. But, uh, but, but people want to see, you know, they want role models, they want to network the same way that, uh, that women want role models and, and to network, I think. And, uh, and I think those meetings have tended to be uh, fairly well attended and, and very important for graduate students. Uh, uh, you know, those, uh, uh, but it's, uh, and we do get money, we do get support for it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think there, there could be a lot more of it. Uh, anyway, sorry. I'm... No, no, that, that's, that's fine. Naira, I think you have your hand up. Yes, yes. Well, in the United Kingdom, we collect a lot of data. We collect a lot of data. So, yes, we do, you know, when it comes to, to race, we do say, you know, what race you are. And we do have that section, you know, which you don't understand. But we do collect a lot of data. But so let me give you a warning, what you know, what happens in the United Kingdom. So what happens is we collect data and then we find out that this group is underrepresented and everybody goes, oh, this is really bad. This group is underrepresented. And then they sit back and they said, so what we're going to do about it? I know next year we're going to collect more data. And then next year they collect more data and they look at the data and they say, guess what? This group is still underrepresented. It's thinking, oh dear, this group is still underrepresented. Oh, what are we going to do? I know. In 10 years time, let's collect more data. And in 10 years time, they collect more data and they say, guess what? What? The group is still underrepresented. Oh, shame. What are we going to do? Let's collect more data in 20 years time. And they keep on doing that and keep on doing that. And you get, you know, me being a mathematician, I love data, but come on, enough is enough. Do something about it. That's that's the problem when you can move to the next stage. Collecting data is, is important, but if this doesn't lead to action or change, then the exercise becomes meaningless. Right, right. Definitely well well said. And and with that, um, maybe we should have our panel close because um, we are getting a little bit short here on time. Um, so I do want to have Marie Francois, who's going to give some closing remarks. But first, I wanted to thank all of our panelists here. It really has been a great discussion. I wish that we could spend more time chatting about these topics. But but I want to thank everyone for your comments and words. Yeah, I mean, uh, I really don't have much to, to add. I think it was a very good opportunity for the two, uh, uh, for the two uh, committees to, to know each other better and to, to exchange very interesting uh, ideas. And uh, I hope we, we get people to, to look at the panel and to, and to tell us also in the future what they've been thinking because it will not be very interactive initially, but of course people can always contact us if they, they want to contribute to the topics of the discussion. So I really invite people who are going to, to listen to the record to, to express themselves and uh, tell us what they, what they think. So thank you.
So, Marie Francois, thank you very much for your closing remark. And uh, I would like to thank all the speaker panelists and uh, the, those who participate in the discussion. Uh, I hope everybody is enjoy uh, enjoy uh, the uh, panel, and the um, it will bring uh, the future in mathematical community. So, thank Great. you very much for your attention. Thank you.